Hello, everyone, and welcome to our MechSite sponsored event titled Multivalent RNA CAR T cell for malignant glioma. My name is Geert Nobles, and I'm the Director of Sales in Europe at MechSite. I will be your moderator for today's engaging session. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. <clears throat> I'm excited to introduce our speaker for today's session. Professor Dennis Migliorini completed his MD studies in internal medicine postgraduate training at the universities of Toulouse and Strasbourg. He then moved to the University Hospital of Geneva, where he completed his postgraduate training in medical oncology under the mentorship of Professor Pierre-Yves Dietrich. From 2015 to 2016, he successfully completed his clinical fellowship in neuro-oncology. He holds a diploma in advanced studies in clinical trial management from the University of Geneva and became principal investigator of several early phase trials testing various anti-tumor immunotherapy approaches, including peptide vaccines for the treatment of glioblastoma. From 2017 to 2019, he performed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Cellular Immunotherapies, University of Pennsylvania, in the laboratories of Professor Carl June and Professor Avery Posey. He trained in synthetic biology and T-cell engineering disciplines that enabled the development of CAR T cell technology. In 2019, he was awarded the Swiss Bridge Foundation Prize in recognition of his work identifying neurotoxicity mechanisms of engineered cell therapies. Returning to Switzerland in 2020, he was appointed assistant professor at the Department of Medicine at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Geneva and holds the ISRAC Chair in Brain Tumor Immunology. At the University Hospital in Geneva, he is an attending physician, head of the Neuro Oncology Unit, <clears throat> and clinical coordinator of the Brain <clears throat> Tumor Biobank. Professor Migliorini is a member of the CRTHO Steering Committee. Thank you for joining us, Dennis. We look forward to this information session. You may now begin your presentation. Thanks a lot, <clears throat> Gerd. Um... It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today and um, to present updates on uh, our uh, research efforts in the lab. And um, the title of my talk today is uh, Multivalent RNA CAR T for um, Malignant Glioma, Brain Tumors. And um, I'm going to start by this conflict of interest slide. I'm a mentor of some patents uh, filed by the University of Pennsylvania uh, and uh, University of Geneva, among others. Uh, I wanted to start by explaining a little bit what we're doing in the lab. Um, it's a brain tumor and immune cell engineering lab. So basically, we are very much interested in um, identifying cell surface uh, markers of uh, tumor cells, but also tumor microenvironment uh, using single cell genomics. And our focus really is to generate novel CAR T cells, but also engineering uh, not only immune cells, but also tumor cells. And uh, working on a variety of, di of different brain tumor uh, models in mice, immunogenic, uh, immunocompetent or immunocompromised. And uh, as Gert mentioned, uh, we are curating a biobank of human brain tumors um, that now accounts up to 1,500 brain tumors with matched PBMCs from patients. And that's very important because we can generate cell lines, um, uh, tumor organoids, uh, assembloids, and uh, all, all of these are very important for us to test all the different uh, CAR-T approaches that we are generating. So uh, there's a variety of different CAR-T challenges that we address. Uh, the one I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, multivalent RNA CAR-T approaches. Uh, a work that started in uh, Avery Pose's lab and Carl June's lab back in my time in Philadelphia and uh, uh, using the RNA technology and the different targets that uh, we are going after is based on previous work uh, out of our vaccination uh, clinical trials. 
that were um, performed here in Geneva. Um, other challenges are, um, uh, you know, attempting to uh, reduce neurotoxicity following C19 uh, CAR T cell treatments, um, and that's a follow-up project since our uh, publication in Cell. We have collaborators from both Penn and, and Stanford, and other different uh, projects where we're interested in looking at uh, metabolism of CAR T cells. In this case, we published last year the inhibition of a mitochondrial pyruvate carrier uh, that allows to have a better metabolic fitness of these T cells, persistence, and uh, anti tumor eff efficacy. Uh, also, combining CAR Ts with other immune cells, such as dendritic cell progenitors. Uh, uh, some work is going to be uh, hopefully published soon in, uh, in, um, in, in one of our new publications and some other aspects, which I'm not going to go into detail today. So here's a background slide. Uh, I'm sure many of you are versed in the, uh, uh, the terrible disease, uh, which are high-grade gliomas. Uh, it's important to... Uh, <clears throat> say that 26 southern uh, primary brain tumors are diagnosed per year in U in us around 600 per year in switzerland most of them are glioblastomas so the highest grade grade four uh, gliomas and as you can see on the um, left hand side uh, with the survival curves here despite the standard treatment that combines surgery and chemo radiation as per the Stuttgart protocol uh, plus or minus tumor treating fields, the overall survival, unfortunately, is less than two years for these patients. And we really need uh, innovative new approaches, and immunotherapy is one of them. Um, many groups across the globe are working on different approaches to harness the immune system to target these tumors. The problem is that there are a variety of different obstacles for uh, immunotherapy in high-grade glioma. The first one is that this tumor is really the archetype of heterogeneity. Uh, there's a cluster of different cell population that express different markers and makes it really hard to, uh, to target. The second challenge is that there's a uh, MHC peptide complex presentation that is downregulated in these tumors. And as a result, the immune cells that patrol around these tumors don't recognize those. Um, there's a very strong immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment composed by a variety of different cells, macrophages, uh, MDSCs, uh, T regulatory cells, and an uh, anatomical barrier with the uh, blood brain barrier that actually permits only a partial efflux of T cells in the brain. <clears throat> Not to mention potential to serious toxicity because we cannot allow to have an uncontrolled immune response in the brain that is an uh, anatomical. Uh, sites in which the volume is restricted by the skull. So um, there, uh, there's a lot of biological challenges in GBM uh, and available preclinical models to study them, especially for uh, uh, this tumor. We need to have ways to target them by having an optimized antigen coverage since it's very heterogeneous avoid as much as possible antigen escape, uh, have a very specific antigen-specific approach, ideally targeting immunosuppressive microenvironment and modify T cells in such a way that they can traffic uh, to the tumor. And so for this, we have immunodeficient uh, mouse models in which we inoculate xenografts. Um, we can study clinically relevant heterogeneous tumors in immunodeficient mouse, model, mouse models with uh, PDXs as well. Um, we can use uh, humanized mouse models where we can use um, uh, human CAR T cells in presence of also human immune cells, but in that case, the immune system is not complete. Or we can use either syngenetic or transgenic mouse models where the mouse are immunocompetent. All of these models have advantages and disadvantages and uh, it's important to try to use uh, both of them. What are the clinical challenges um, with the use of uh, patient-derived T cells in glioma? The first one is that when we use uh, retroviral, lentiviral transduction, uh, the vein-to-vein -vein interval is can be three to six weeks. And that's very important because in the context of high-grade glioma, the tumor is very likely to uh, progress in that time frame, um, and in that 
period of time of manufacturing, new neurological symptoms can require steroids. It can hamper the potential efficacy of the following cell therapy. Uh, there's also reports of gliomas that cause sequestration of T cells in the bone marrow, and thus limiting the availability of the CAR T cells. And also at recurrence, since these patients received radiation, chemotherapy, they're uh, highly immunosuppressed, which is an, an additional challenge. So this is the clinical setting in these patient population. Um, <clears throat> looking at the single cell level, uh, when you dissect GBM tumors, you can see on the left-hand side, a, uh, a single cell um, RNA sequencing data from healthy patients um, that were operated for a condition not related to TAP tumors. And you can see the cell populations, the neurons, uh, the, the oligodendrocyte, the vascular uh, niche. And when you go on the right-hand side, you see a typical uh, single-cell RNA CQ map projection of a GBM tumor. This is data collected from nine different patients. And you can see that you have, of course, <clears throat> about half of the bulk tumor that is composed by uh, neoplastic cells and astrocytes, but also a clear, very important infiltration of macrophages and uh, oligodendrocytes. So it's very important to engineer immune cells that not only consider intertumor cell diversity, but also non-tumoral cells and cells from the microenvironment. Okay, so the uh, current targets uh, for CAR T cells in malignant glioma in adults that were tested in the clinic and for which we have preliminary results are the following. There, there were the anti uh, 13 receptor alpha 2 CAR, the HER2 CAR, and uh, the EGFR uh, V3 specific CAR, uh, Acetoho, Baylor, and PAN UCSF. So basically, all of the three targets for which we have results from uh, phase one trials were overall safe. Uh, some objective radiological responses were observed with expansions of uh, cells in vivo and uh, an immunosuppressive adaptive response in the patient that were reoperated or recurrence was observed with invariably tumor escape. So we need new target identification, designing uh, tumor mac environment modulating synthetic molecules. And I uh, very much believe that we need multivalent CAR T cells to, uh, to avoid as much as possible antigen escape. And now the list, uh, as you can see here, there's a grow growing list of reported engineered T cell approaches for brain tumors. I'm not gonna go into detail, but you can see on the left-hand side, the different list of preclinical data that were reported, the different approaches, different cars, specificities and constructs. On the uh, blue square here, you have the uh, cars that were currently investigated in the clinic. And most of them are, um, all of them actually are monospecific approaches, except two new clinical trials that were recently opened, one at the University of Pennsylvania with a bacistronic uh, i 2 plus EGFRV3 targeting car, and one at UCSF with a seam notch construct um, for which we have an inducible uh, expression of two additional cars upon engagement of an EGFRV3 specific car. So these two clinical trials are going to be very informative for the field um, and for uh, the anti-tumor effect and potential toxicity. So I wanted to show some data from uh, previously reported uh, approaches. One is from City of Hope. As you can see here, a scorpion venom chlorotoxin car that it's actually binding a uh, metalloprotein as MMT2 on the surface of GBM cells. Uh, investigators in this case tested different constructs, as you can see on the bottom left. And uh, <clears throat> they were able to show autotopic xenograft tumor models, uh, anti tumor effect with the glovotoxin CAR, with an improved uh, immune synapse, and um, the effector activity actually required of course, the target expression of MMP2 on the target cells. And there's a clinical trial ongoing now. There's an anti-pen cancer marker B7H3 CAR. It is very interesting because it's expressed not only in brain tumors, but also in a variety of different solid tumors. You can see here on the immunohistochemistry stainings, um, Edwin's sarcoma, metalloblastoma, um, that are actually expressing high levels. 
And uh, you can see on the right that the killing of these uh, capacity of these CAR T's is proportional to the B73 density of the tumor cells. There's also a clinical trial ongoing for this approach. Now, I'm sure that many of you heard about the success of the GD2 targeting CAR at uh, the ACR meeting uh, last year and also the recently published paper on New England Journal of Medicine from uh, colleagues in uh, Rome in Italy. Uh, in this particular paper that you can see on the slide, four patients were treated. Three out of four had a partial response with pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, levels, both in the blood but also in the CSF. One million cells were injected uh, per kilo in uh, intravenously, and then if a clinical benefit was uh, observed, an intracular infusion was uh, uh, made, and no on target of, of tumor toxicity was observed. And as you can see in the imaging, there was really an objective radiological response in some instances. The interventricular B7H3 car <clears throat> for diffuse intrinsic uh, pontine glioma it's a brainchild trial, a first in human phase one trial, where um, three patients with the IPG was treated with no uh, dose limiting toxicity, uh, one radiographic improvement for 12 months, and two slow progressions. And the correlative studies were very, very interesting in this trial because uh, persistent CSF B7H3 specific cars were observed with high concentration of a variety of different pro inflammatory cytokines. As you can see, here, <clears throat> CCL2, CXL12, 10 uh, GMCSM were highly uh, produced with these cells that were biologically active. Another very interesting report is a uh, off the shelf steroid resistant IL13 uh, zetokine CAR T cell for uh, the treatment of GBM. In this case, six adult patients were um, treated with unresectable recurrent GBM. And they were maintained under a systemic dexamethasone uh, dose. So a really high dose, 4 to 12 milligrams a day. And these cells were allergenic uh, because they were uh, co-cultured with uh, lymphoblastic uh, cell lines with a very specific protocol. And um, they were given to patients in a uh, combination with IL-2. And the very interesting approach here is that the investigators, they um, uh, edited, gene edited, uh, using zinc finger nuclease, the uh, uh, glucocorticoid receptor by disrupting it. And basically, these cells were insensitive to the cortisone that was given to these patients. And here are some findings. Uh, you could see local necrosis based on the um, uh, improvement of the MRI enhancement on the gadolinium uh, images. And also, um, metabolic tumors uh, consistent with necrosis was observed. In this case, you had two patients uh, that, that are displayed uh, in which we see less metabolism uh, in this tumor after treatment. And also evidence of anti-tumor banked activity, uh, but unfortunately, no objective survival benefit was documented in this study. Now, I'm getting at the multivalent approach um, by starting introducing the, this very interesting paper where um, um, Christine Brown and colleagues at City of Hope looked at 43 patient cohort samples using single cell mapping of three different targets, IL-13, alpha 2 HER2, and EGFR. And what's very important here is that uh, it was uh, obvious that there's a large variation in the magnitudes of the distribution of the target antigen expression. And I'd just like you to, to focus on the panel A on the top right. You can see at the h &E staining, the heterogeneity within the, sing, the, the, the same tumor from a single patient and the immunoactivity that changes in this tumor across the different letters that you can see, uh, it really goes to show that um, we need to um, choose broadly distributed uh, targets <clears throat> and multivalent immunotherapy strategies that also need to be adapted to each patient. So that's called personalized oncology. And so how can you do this? Um, there's a different ways to 
sorry, <clears throat> different ways to um, generate multivalent CAR T approaches. One can either, you know, generate different T cell population expressing a single CAR and then mix them and uh, treat with those, or uh, use a single cell product that will each cell will express uh, different CAR specificities. Or you have also tandem CARs and inducible constructs, so um, a lot of different uh, methods. Here's one such approach where, in this case, uh, a tricystronic uh, plasmid encoding for three different CARs was used. You can see that um, the cells were reactive, secreting cytokines, and were able to form an improved immune setups with the target. And with the relevant mouse models, uh, anti-tumor efficacy and improved survival was observed. Um, the problem with this approach is that a single vector construct would not allow to have a really personalized targeting strategy according to each patient. You would need a more flexible platform for this. Uh, another way to do so is synodge inducible cars. Um, and in this report from uh, Professor Ideo Kukara's group at UCSF, you can see uh, here, very um, relevant and uh, efficient way to target heterogeneity. In this case, uh, a xeno heterogeneous xenoline called GBM6 was used, um, and uh, a synodge uh, card was uh, specific for EGFR. And then, in turn, when the first target is bound, it triggers the expression of two different cars, in this case, specific for FA2 and. Um, um, IL-13 receptor for two. And you can see the anti-tumor control that is uh, very much improved with the same notch uh, car construct. <clears throat> and post-treatment uh, with the uh, inducible construct, you have uh, a loss of antigen expression and a clearance of the GBM6 xenograft. So our experience in Geneva has been first to identify glioma-associated antigens. So we did it by <clears throat> analyzing um, glioblastoma tumors from patients operated in our clinic using uh, first uh, MHC peptide dilution and then uh, mass spectrometry. And that allowed us to retrieve more than around 3,000 uh, HLA-A2 restricted peptides. After that, uh, long and uh, rigorous selection process started in which we only kept the peptides that were overexpressed in glioma, absent or not expressed in uh, healthy tissues with a function that is associated with tumor genesis and these peptides had to be immunogenic. So we came up with a list of uh, nine peptides that you can see on the bottom left that we tested in a phase one, two trial in which a newly diagnosed um, um, high-grade glioma patients were included. Uh, these patients were HLA-A2 restricted. So they underwent surgery, chemo radiation as per the Stroop protocol, and then uh, had two phases of vaccination, an induction phase with uh, vaccination one close to the other, and then one vaccination in between each temozolomide cycle. So what happened in the clinic, you can see <clears throat> with the MRI here, that uh, some patients presented some pseudo progressions uh, and they were clinically intact. So no neurological deterioration. So that allowed us to continue the vaccination protocol. And over time, as you can see here, this patient actually had a response and it was uh, a T cell immune infiltration that gave this uh, enhancement uh, at the MRI. Uh, we also observed some cerebral edema in four patients out of 19 especially after the fourth vaccination. And in this case, we, uh, as you can see here, the tumor underneath this edema did not grow. It's just that edema was very important. So we had to stop the vaccination protocol, use high-dose steroids, and then we could resume it afterwards and resume the vaccination uh, treatment. So initially we didn't have any immune response in the six first patients. So we amended the protocol. We reduced the number of vaccination and then uh, infuse the vaccine only in one uh, lymph node draining cell. And at that time, we started having immune response for CD8s and CD4s to multiple uh, antigens containing the vaccine. <clears throat> so here's a first set of observation. 
Uh, we ran, in the meantime, a second clinical trial for recurrent GBM patients. In that, in that trial, we treated with the same vaccine, plus or minus pembrolizumab, because at the time there was a lot of suggestion saying it would be synergistic to add a peptide vaccine that is multi-specific to a, a P1 inhibitor. So we're currently completing the immune monitoring for this second trial. In this case, the value of the studies that we have access to brain samples after immunotherapy, so we're gonna analyze the response in situ. But as of uh, now, we have only weak responses. Um, of course, these were recurrent GBM patients that were highly immunosuppressed. Um, but we could see in some of these uh, patients that receive a combination, a really important intratumoral T cell infiltration. But overall, <clears throat> there was no later impact on survival. So we really need, I do believe we need to infuse high number of antigen-specific cells in the tumor site, either TCR engineered or CAR T cells. And that will have an, also CAR T the advantage of uh, uh, not being uh, depending on the MHC plus one recognition, which is done regulated in GBM. So our approach is to propose uh, a personalized um, multivalent RNA CAR uh, treatment. In each letter that you see in the circle is a different CAR for which we have a library of different specificities based on some of the targets that were previously uh, described in the neuro-oncology uh, paper and uh, brain in 2012. And the reason why I chose to uh, use mRNA is that it offers a lot of different opportunities, especially in the context of brain tumors, uh, as compared to antivirally transduced cars. The first one is that, and some might say this is a disadvantage, but actually, for brain tumors, it is not. Having a transient expression potentially could be safer, especially since uh, nobody ever investigated before a multi-specific CAR-T approach of cells in infiltrated, um, infused in the brain. <clears throat> it also allows multiple infusions and to personalize the therapies. Uh, since we can infuse multiple times through an Amaya reservoir, we can adapt the specificity of these cars according to what, whatever the tumor is expressing. Um, multiple RNA car, RNAs can be electroporated safely into T cells, <clears throat> especially, and that's what I'm going to show here with the uh, device like the Maxide that allows to have high availability and high transfection efficiency. The third advantage of mRNA is the manufacturing turnaround time. So we could have a very quick vein-to-vein -vein or vein-to-brain interval by using RNA that is extrapolating to the T cell, and basically the day after we can infuse the cells that are expressing high levels of the CAR, as opposed to the uh, 14 days, three weeks uh, manufacturing time of CAR Ts when we uh, transduce um, the viral vector. And also, it's a very flexible platform. Since we have the RNA, we can not only extrapolate the RNA, but also in vivo engineer the immune cells using, for example, lipid nanoparticles. OK, so this is our processing flow. Basically, we get um, blood cells from healthy donors. We bead activate them, uh, and then let them sit for uh, uh, 48 hours, electroporate with the Maxide GTX that we have in the lab, the RNA that encodes for the car. And 18 hours later, we cryopreserve the cells. <clears throat> and then we have them at hand. We can thaw them and test them with different uh, cytotoxicity acid and test them in vitro and in vivo. So the very first um, car that we tested in our hands was an L13 receptor for two car for which we can see uh, results upon electroporation. You see on the top right that we have around 97% um, live cells after electroporation with high car expression levels. 87% of the cells were CAR, CAR positive. We tested those <clears throat> using three cell lines from patients uh, operating in our clinic with GBM tumors. And uh, you can see on the panel C that the two out of those cell lines express high levels of L13 receptor for two target, and one virtually did not express it. 
So we looked carefully every day at the level of car molecule expression by flow cytometry. And you can see that basically at day seven, the T cells don't express it anymore. This is known. It's a transient expression. And then we tested those CAR Ts <clears throat> with the three different cell lines. And you can see that with the, the cell that express high levels of the target, they are efficiently killed, but not with the ones that don't express it. And this is also um, recapitulated with the interferon gamma uh, secretion assay. So we started by develop, um, developing one RNA car with one of the targets that is proprietary that I'm going to call X from now on. We uh, first uh, described uh, if whether or not it's expressed at high levels on tumor cells as opposed to healthy brain tissues. So we took uh, bulk RNA-seq data sets that are publicly available, TCGA and Rembrandt, and you can see that it's uh, overexpressed in this case. <clears throat> We also reanalyzed data sets from um, uh, single cell RNA seq uh, data from uh, patients with GBM tumors. Um, uh, and basically, you can see that this uh, target is very much expressed at high levels on tumor cells, but also on uh, oligoprogenitor cells, which means that uh, glioma stem like cells express it as well, which can be very interesting for uh, adjuvant approaches where. Uh, tumor is rejected, but you always have um, uh, stem cells that are actually responsible for recurrence. So, uh, the real postdoc in my lab uh, generated these uh, RNA cars and started by first looking at the binding and recognition using the cell, uh, the cell line that expresses the target with <clears throat> the different um, RNA cars that we have. So basically all of the different numbers that you see, 476, 474, and so forth, are different SCFBs that we generated through a panning of a human face display library. And so we have different antibodies for which we uh, uh, used to generate our cars. And then you can see the car expression, 24 hours post site preparation with the max site. <clears throat> and you can see that most of them have very high expression levels up to 94. 93% and some others uh, a little less. So we tested those uh, in the 72 hour cytotoxicity assay repeatedly, and we kept the one that was uh, more consistently um, achieving the, anti, the best anti tumor control, in this case, the 471 BBZ card. So, what the IL did is that it compared uh, different cosmetory molecules, the killing capacity, and also uh, a ruled out any tonic signaling using jerked reporter cells. You can see that, for example, with the 47128 zeta car, when co-cultured with um, uh, jerked cells, sorry, when co-cultured with tumor that express the target, you have a, a transcriptive factor uh, upregulation that is uh, uh, seen with NFAT, NF-kappa B, and AP1 upregulation, as opposed to when these jerked car positive cells are expressed or co-cultured with um, targets that don't express, uh, cells that don't express a target. Uh, you also compared uh, gene expression and uh, different genes um, for activation, suppression, effectory, and memory phenotype uh, through qPCR with different hinges and uh, we didn't see any modifications. And then we tested in, in vivo <clears throat> with an NSG mice uh, inoculated orthotopically directly in the brain with a human um, uh, GBM cell line that expresses a target. And after uh, tumor engraftment verification uh, by bioluminescence, we infused orthotopically the RNA cars and then uh, looked at the tumor response by IVIS twice a week. So basically, if you look at the bottom uh, in the PBS and non transduced or uh, uh, cells, the tumor continues to grow, of course. And in the RNA car condition, you have a stabilization of the tumor and then it grows back. <clears throat> so keep in mind that here you have a monospecific RNA car that was uh, sufficiently efficient to um, trigger the stabilization, even a, a striking response in one of the mouse. And uh, that um, translated in an improvement of survival that is uh, significant. 
So you can imagine what would happen if you put different specificity cars simultaneously. So we were very um, excited about this data. And actually, that's actually what we're doing now is testing these RNA cars in combination. We generated another one uh, uh, for which the target in this case is uh, Y. Uh, we tested the uh, binding of different phages with different cell lines that differ express different levels of the antigen as compared to the commercial anti, uh, antibody. Then uh, we generated a car, uh, RNA cars again, looked at car expression post egg preparation, uh, very high levels again, transfection efficiency and viability. We also looked at the binding ability of these car molecules that were bearing different uh, Y-specific cars using these uh, Lumix assay, where basically you look at the acoustic force. And uh, we were able to compare head-to-head -head the validity of, of, of these cars. That's very important for uh, the, the screening of these molecules and, uh, and cell products and characterization. Then we tested cytotoxicity, cytokine uh, secretion profiles with these cars using three cell lines, two glioblastoma cell lines from uh, patients that were operated here, and one melanoma cell line that expresses a target <clears throat> using a control car uh, from NIH that is known to be efficient. Uh, you can see that actually the anti-tumor uh, efficiency uh, is uh, very much dependent on the level of antigen expression. Then you can see what the blue um, uh, bar here, but the cytokine secretion is uh, also very high, even for cell lines that express lower level of the antigen on the cell surface. And uh, the next step for us is having a single cell product that expresses different cards, and that for manufacturing uh, purposes is very important for us. And um, the thing we did is to generate a proof of concept with a triple RNA IL preparation. So we took two cars, one specific for GD2, one specific for CSPG4, and also IL preparated um, a uh, APC binding molecule, in this case, CD40 ligand. And you can see that actually uh, triples, uh, we had around 71% of triple positive cells in this case. So <clears throat> we're able to generate these multi-specific uh, T cells. And the next step now is going to be to test those both in vitro and in vivo. With the idea of uh, proposing a, a clinical trial where we would have our proprietary target cars uh, alongside the usual suspects that are uh, already used and uh, tested as monospecific cars in the clinic, we would operate the patient at uh, the labs, identify the cell surface targets that are expressed, and pick and choose from this library the RNAs that are specific for, um, for the tumor and, uh, and use uh, as a single cell product uh, these cells for treatment uh, infused directly in the tumor through an MI reservoir. So here are my conclusions today. <clears throat> the first is that GD2 and IL-13 receptor for two cars show preliminary signs of clinical efficacy. It's very important to consider the route of delivery uh, to increase, uh, and there's an increasing evidence of uh, the intra-CNS route. GBM tumor heterogeneity and the antigen special distribution uh, really need to be addressed, and multivalent cars can allow to, to do this. The RNA car platform has advantages over a lentiviral transduction, but especially in the context of GBM. Um, so we really need to develop, I think, novel multispecific RT cells. We really need to keep in mind that non-tumor cells matter. Tumor-associated macrophages, among others, are uh, very clinically relevant target cells, and we need to really tilt the balance towards more pro-inflammatory macrophages, that's going to be a, a game changer. And mobilizing the innate immunity using either dendritic cells, oncolytic viruses, combined with CAR Ts, uh, there are already uh, some reports that it's synergistic and it would need to be done. And of course, um, uh, I'm sure all of you are convinced that cell and gene therapy are promising tools to tackle all of these challenges. So, 
I'd like to thank the uh, <clears throat> funding organization, the ISREC um, Foundation, especially in the Swiss National Science Foundation and other funding bodies that are supporting our work. All my lab members, um, that's a photograph actually of uh, two years ago. It has uh, changed, but uh, uh, I'm very grateful to all the different lab members that are really pushing forward uh, these approaches and all of our collaborations back at Penn uh, and more widely in uh, Geneva, Lausanne, and some other uh, centers in Europe. And I would be happy <clears throat> to take any question. And again, I apologize for my voice today. I, I, caught, I caught a cold, so uh, I hope it was understandable for all of you. Thank you, Dr. Miglurini, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Uh, just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Um, the first question is something that you touched upon during the presentation, but can you please again summarize uh, what are the advantages of RNA electroporation as opposed to lentiviral transduction? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, indeed I touch upon it. Um, so for very specific uh, clinical indications such as primary brain tumors, where we really need to be uh, cautious about potential uh, toxicity, having a CAR T cell product that is only transiently present uh, will definitely limit potential toxicity. So RNA platform allows it. And um, I would say the second most important advantage is really the manufacturing time by using the electroporation, as I showed here with the <clears throat> Maxi GTX electroporator. In uh, 48 hours, basically, um, you have a CAR T cell product that is ready to use, really as opposed to the 14 days uh, standard protocol using the antivirally transduced uh, T cells. So yeah, Thank I would you. say these are the two main advantages. Absolutely. Thank you. Next question uh, is the following. I would like to know the overall process yield when making RNA CAR T. For example, when you prepare 100 patient cells, how many positive cells can you get in total after delivering RNA? Yeah. So. As I showed the uh, transfection efficiency, um, I would say virtually more than 90% of the cells that are electroporated are CAR positive. So the transfection efficiency is very uh, high. Uh, for a single specificity CAR, for which, for example, I showed you six different CARs, uh, some have a better expression, some have a lower expression, but basically the yeah, electroporation is, um, is very efficient for um, the car expression. So to respond specifically, uh, out of 100 cells, we have 94, 95 that are car expressing. I see there's a lot of questions popping. Yeah, and a question on HLA peptides, for instance. The screening for HLA peptides required some relationship of, uh, with tumorogenesis. Could it be that some peptides without relation to tumor genesis are interesting as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think that we, uh, especially in the context of GBM, it's not like other solid tumors in which you have a very high tumor mutational burden, a lot of neoantigens. This is not the case in GBM. So we need to identify peptides, antigens that are overexpressed and for which we are confident that it will not trigger toxicity with healthy brain tumors. Uh, ideally, if it uh, could be antigens that are responsible or you know, uh, markers of tumor genesis, it would be even better, but uh, going after overexpressed antigen is, um, I would say, mandatory, at least for uh, glioma. Thank you. Another question coming in, did you use a T-cell activation and electroporation protocol provided by Maxite, or was it very laborious to optimize the electroporation conditions with the Maxite platform? 
So um, we, we work hand in hand. Um, we, uh, I, um, there are a variety of different ways to uh, generate um, uh, RNA CAR T's into electroporate. We can use you know, previously expanded cells, uh, frozen, then thawed, and um, you can thaw them at IL-2, electroporate, and then you have RNA CARs. But what, what uh, we found actually through this collaboration is that by bead activating them, you know, you put them into a condition where they're reaching the log phase and the expansion phase, they're going to upload the RNA <clears throat> after a, a, upon extrapolation way more efficiently. And also the uh, functional capacity in vitro was compared and uh, was way more efficient. So, of course, it took some time to optimize this uh, and uh, we uh, we didn't make it ourselves uh, on, on our side. Yeah, it was a collaboration on my side. Thank you. Another question coming in is in vivo endocytosis of nanoparticles by non T cells, for instance, endothelial cells preventable. Oh, in vivo endocytosis, nanoparticles. Um, so we haven't done that yet. But um, there's a very, uh, I think, breakthrough um, publication from uh, Drew Weissman and Carl June's group where they are targeting uh, using lipid nanoparticle um, circulating T cells. And these NNPs were decorated with CD5 antibodies. So basically, all the T cells were uh, endocytosing the, uh, the uh, NNPs and the RNAs, and as opposed to any other uh, cells. And that was sufficient to uh, prevent um, uh, myocardial uh, infarction through a FAP targeting car. So I think you can uh, generate nanoparticles that are specific for a cell population through this um, uh, method. And um, yeah, it's preventable. Thank you. If you have uh, any further questions you'd like to ask to Dr. Migliorini, please click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I think we still have a couple of minutes time left for uh, some additional questions. There is a question. Can you comment on the sourcing where you get your RNA from? And is it GMP grade? Yeah, that's a question from Tobias in Zurich. Hi, Tobias. So um, we made the RNA ourselves um, uh, using a, um, a plasmid that is optimized for RNA uh, production, and it's not GMP grade. So um, because we made it in the lab, and to have a GMP grade <clears throat> for the clinical trial, we would have to go to um, um, specialized vendors uh, that actually are going to produce it in a GMP. Uh, respecting GMP protocols. Thank you, Dr. Miglorini. You mentioned the next question, you mentioned a short half-life of your mRNA loaded cells. Is your therapeutic concept different from conventional CAR T cells? Is this single? Absolutely. Concept? Yeah, yeah. It is it is different. <clears throat> Basically here we're not looking at long persisting cells. We uh, chose the strategy of a hit and run, basically. Um, we want multiple specificity cars that are alley activated, secreting cytokines, and hit as many cells, tumor cells, as quickly as possible. And this goes with <clears throat> a, this multiple infusion strategy where we can actually go there multiple times repeatedly so it's really completely different as uh you know the conventional uh, long persistent cars that are used for leukemia and lymphoma yeah. thank you and then i'm just moving over to the last question what is your opinion of p32 targeting with car t do you have any experience um but not really not really i read the paper um uh, that's why I'm signing in uh, in the in in the slide, but I don't have any experience with this particular car. Super, thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dr. Miglorini. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Well, I think it was a, a very nice set of questions. Um, I, I, you, I've been told that there are around 350 um, people that registered. So I think that it's a topic of interest for the field. And uh, I'm very grateful for the organization first, for the collaboration, and also for everyone who attended. Thank you again, Dr. Miglorini, for your time today and your very important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots for supporting uh, today's educational webcast. Uh, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand LabRoots will alert you via email when it's uh, available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. And please do visit maxi.com to learn more about our technology. Thank you very much. Until next time, goodbye.